and in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, we'll turn it over to Cheryl. Amen. Thank you. May the Lord bless us. Um, <clears throat> my introductory comments are that it's nice to be able to be here with you on Zoom. And uh, uh, I just, I, I'm rejoicing at the privilege of being with you. But the facts are that to be here on Zoom is good. And to be there in person is way better. And so I apologize that I can't be there and I'm missing out. And uh, there's a sense in which even you're missing out uh, through the awkwardness of my Zooming position. Nevertheless, uh, we're thankful to be here. Praise the Lord. Good to see a lot of you. I haven't spoken to many, but I see you in the background, and uh, it's delightful that we're together again this year. Um, <clears throat> we uh, decided, I decided that I was going to take the theme this year, Welcome to Cappadocia. And we started on that theme last evening. Um, the, uh, the, the basic theme is that Peter is writing in verses one and two. He's writing to the saints who were scattered, uh, presumably from, uh, from Jerusalem, Judea, and scattered to the uh, cities, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, not really cities, but almost provinces in what today is central northern Turkey. And uh, I think the answer is that uh, they all probably would have been happier to be back in Jerusalem, in Judea, elsewhere. I don't think they were all happy to be in Cappadocia and the other neighboring regions. And uh, <clears throat> the theme that we're going to follow uh, in these sessions uh, is that we find ourselves in circumstances that we don't necessarily consider to be ideal either. And how do we cope in those circumstances? And so we considered some of the verses, the first five verses of First Peter chapter 1 last night, and we'll carry on in verse 6 and following this morning. But once again, let's ask the Lord for help. Lord, we do pray that you will speak to our hearts. Fact is that many of us go through circumstances in life that are unpleasant, and then often they become far worse than that. And we pray, Lord, that we might stand tall in the difficulties of life. And we pray that you'll teach us from uh, the wisdom of Peter into these circumstances. So uh, go before us. Help us this morning. Thank you for all that we've already learned this morning. Bless and continue to bless, we pray. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we got to verse 5 last night. Let's read verse 6 together. You know it well. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. And the phrase manifold temptations, I think, is a general phrase that basically relates to the very, very large number of difficulties that we all face in life. I don't know about you, but uh, I think of, of uh, where I would like to be had I lived in the Old Testament. And I would say to myself, I think I'd rather live in the days of Solomon than in the days of Jeremiah. Um, there's, we don't all get the opportunities to rejoice and, and uh, get just excited about the blessing that God brought to Solomon. Uh, we often find ourselves 
in the stresses and distresses of life. And uh, <clears throat> frankly, the year 2022 is not really the most friendly year to the believer. And uh, my understanding is that 2023, apart from the grace of God in our own personal lives, will probably be substantially worse. So the verse 6 puts together the, <clears throat> the two uh, basic themes of our Christian life. Uh, it says, wherein you greatly rejoice. And the Christian is a rejoicer. He's got all the blessings of life. And they also, it is also true that we are in heaviness through the manifold temptations. Speaking to one of our friends from 16th uh, last week, probably, the, the issue was, what do you do in the trials of life? And part of the answer that we gave went something like this. Who was the happiest man that ever lived? And the answer, obviously, is the Lord Jesus. And uh, uh, who had the greatest trials of any man who ever lived? And the answer is the Lord Jesus. And you say, well, how can you put the two together? You ask yourself the question, when was it? that the Lord said to his uh, disciples, um, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. And it was very uh, close in time to his expression, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death just a few hours between those two statements. He was the happiest and the most distressed, if you like, of men. That is the lot of the Christian. And frankly, the new Christian especially finds it very difficult. And my friend who asked the question uh, has been walking with the Lord uh, more zealously, more uh, enthusiastically in the last few years than before. But her question is, uh, it's pretty hard. What, uh, what do you do? How can you get through? And her circumstances are very different from your circumstances and mine. But we all know the tension between rejoicing greatly in the Lord and recognizing that we've got huge problems. I'm not sure that there is a precise definition for the simple phrase manifold temptations. I think it covers a multitude of the circumstances. Persecution uh, certainly for some is part of it. The uh, the adversaries and the adversities of life that uh, uh, Paul says, he says, you remember, uh, uh, there's a great door and a, an effectual a door of opportunity for me, and there are many adversaries. And we say, praise the Lord for the wide open door of opportunity, but the adversaries and the adversities of life are very, very difficult. <laughs> and so the question is, how do we carry them both at the same time? Uh, sometimes you can simply say, I'm just going to forget all about those troubles. And they often grow in magnitude against us. Other people give up on the Christian life. And they say, I just can't stand it. And... Uh, Somehow, we've got to keep that proper balance. And I believe that that is part and probably a major part of the reason for Peter penning this particular epistle to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. I think he recognizes that we've got a big need and we're going to have to be sustained 
along the way. Um, so verse six says, uh, you greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. Uh, sometimes the temptations don't really bother us. Sometimes there is a heaviness and uh, that heaviness uh, is, is a, a, a distress, it's a sadness, it's a problem. And the only reason we've got it is because there's a need for it. You're in heaviness because of the need. If need be, you're in heaviness. So the question is, what is the need? And uh, we've studied the passage before. We know that the need is that somehow we've got to be transformed from the uh, man we were when we trusted the Lord to the person of Jesus Christ. There is a need for that translation. And verse 7 says that the trial of our faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And we trust the Lord as Savior, and we say now, Lord, you just go right ahead. You transform me, please, so that I will praise you and bring you honor and glory. And the Lord says, I will do that, but not always going to be easy. Many of you are fathers. You know the children uh, often have to grow up, and sometimes they stumble and fall. Sometimes they're just overwhelmed by the, uh, by the issues of life. Uh, those issues may seem simple to mommy and daddy, but they're a big deal to junior. And there's no other way around it. If we're going to grow, we must grow through the stresses and distresses of life. It's true even of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, is it Hebrews 5.8 that says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. And you say, well, <laughs> why did the Lord Jesus Christ have to learn everything? Why did he have to learn anything, rather? He's God. What's he have to learn for? And the fact is that the only thing, the only way in which he could learn uh, the experience of, the cost of, the expense of, what it is that you and I go through, the only way he could learn that was by going through it himself. And he suffered in order to learn it. And if it was true of him, true of us. And uh, I guess um, one of the reasons that I, I get drawn back to this theme is that as you live longer in life, you look at people who've gone through the stresses and distresses of life. And not all have succeeded. Some have fallen by the way. And I'm not sure of your heart, <clears throat> But I think I would say that you're something like myself. And as I see a, a brother who fails here, as I see a disappointment, a heartbreak that leaves a great toll there, I cry to the Lord and I say, Lord, would you please keep me through the stresses and distresses of life? I need the Lord's help, frankly. I'll never make it any other way. Uh, and so, uh, verse 6 and 7 again, Whom having not seen we love, in whom, though now we see him not yet believing. I guess I've got the wrong verse. I want to go back to 6. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through the manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And the theme is, it's not just difficulties in the circumstances of life. It is the trial of faith. 
do I really believe enough to go through this trial? I was just speaking to Alex Pang a few minutes ago. Some of you remember Alex. He was on his bicycle driving down the street a few weeks ago, and uh, the car misbehaved. I can't remember all the details. He was thrown from his bike, dragged for several feet under one of the cars. And his body went through all kinds of contortions. And uh, his arm was fractured. And his face was bruised to the point where he said, you know, uh, I, I think I'm beginning to understand um, what it was like when the Lord's visage was marred more than any man's. He didn't look like a man, the Lord Jesus. And Alex, when he looked himself in the mirror, said, I don't look very good. Now, Alex didn't say, this is a trial of faith. I say, for Alex, this would be a trial of faith. If it were me, I think I would say, why me, Lord? Why wasn't it Waldo? Why did the guy in that other car do what he did anyway? And through it all, you've got to say, I believe the Lord is in it, but it becomes a trial of faith. How much do I believe the Lord? So those are verses six and seven. Back now to verse eight. He says, whom having not seen, we love. In whom, though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Whom, having not seen, ye love. I think Kevin had the question last evening. Uh, what about some of these uh, uh, had they not seen the Lord before? And uh, uh, the answer probably is yes, some of them had seen the Lord before, and uh, some of them had not seen the Lord before. We're not sure uh, about all the people at Cappadocia, but there could have been some who had seen the Lord before. I wonder if this reference, whom having not seen, may very well be similar to the comments that Mary and Martha had after having advised the Lord that Lazarus was sick. And uh, you can imagine Mary saying to Martha, uh, go to the window again and see if the Lord Jesus is coming. And one day goes into the next. And I can imagine one of them uh, just going for a short walk to the turn of the road so they could look down the road further and say, isn't, isn't the Lord coming yet? There's somebody, there's, some, there's a group way down there, maybe a mile down the road. I wonder if that's the Lord. And the people come forward and they say, no, that, that's not the Lord. And if anybody was looking forward to seeing the Lord, it was Mary and Martha as Lazarus got sicker and sicker and ultimately died. And they hadn't seen the Lord. Oh, they, they'd seen him in other circumstances, but they were looking forward to seeing him in these circumstances. And... He didn't show up. Uh, they put it very clearly. They said, Lord, you didn't show up on time. You could have come earlier, you know. This whole calamity could have been prevented. If you had come earlier, Lord, had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But look at the terrible mess we're in now. And... Verse 8 is marvelous, whom having not seen, we love. Did Mary and Martha love him any less? 
when he didn't show up on time? No. But was it easy for them when he didn't show up on time? Peter says, in whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable. And uh, I'm not sure that what that word unspeakable means. Does it mean that you're rejoicing with joy that is so great you can hardly, you can hardly contain it? Or does it mean that you're uh, rejoicing with a joy that you find very hard to explain, that others can't explain? Sometimes the others come to you and encourage you with a few verses of scripture here and there, and you say, that's wonderful, thank you very much, but I'm still aching, you know. It might be persecution. It might be the calamities of life outside. It might be the calamities of life in the home, in the family, yes, in the assembly. Uh, could you explain all those to us in detail, please? Can you explain the joy that you have? And you say, no, I, I. all I know is that somehow, in the midst of this great calamity, I've even got joy. Somehow we, we uh, seek the joy by diversion. And sometimes we're bold enough to look the problem square in the eye. Say, Lord, uh, it's true. I rejoice with a joy I can't explain because of the believing. The next line is very interesting, isn't it? You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. What is Mercer's message? It's all about the glory of God. You read through scripture, <clears throat> You see the lines that say that you can be the agent of bringing glory to God. And you say that <laughs> that's not possible. How could a little old insignificant me bring glory to the Lord? You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Whose glory is that? The answer is, by the grace of God, as the hymn writer has said, that will be glory for me. But that's not the only issue here. It's glory for God. So what do you think God said when he looked down at Job, who went through it? and stayed under it and was dragged backwards and forwards and, and all the other <laughs> issues that confronted him. Is that glory just for Job? Yeah, it was glory for Job, all right. That was glory for the Lord. And the Lord was bragging to the evil one. What a delightful line. Have you considered my servant, Job? Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I guess I've got to be honest enough to say, and you might even agree with me, that there are times in my great distress when I have to say, Lord, don't look. When I have to say, Lord, would you keep the devil from looking? You know, he's not, he's not looking at a Job greatness. He's looking at a poor, weak, defeated. Uh, Boyd Nicholson <clears throat> made himself, uh, <laughs> I better rephrase it. Boyd Nicholson uh, entitled his sermon 
on the book of Job, on the man Job one day, and his sermon went like this. It says, there was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job. And his whole sermon was, now there was a man. And sometimes in circumstances like Job faces, he doesn't, the Lord doesn't always see a man. Peter says Cappadocia isn't the greatest place to live. And the circumstances that are true for Cappadocia are true for all of us here and there and everywhere. Sooner or later, we go through, verse 6, manifold temptations. But the Lord doesn't always see the man that Job was in his manifold temptations. <clears throat> And verse 8 uh, uh, talks about this joy unspeakable and full of glory. But verse 9 says, receiving the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls. Uh, when will that be? And I suppose there's really three, uh, three tenses that are implied there. Certainly, uh, we'll receive the blessing when we get to glory. And we say hallelujah. And uh, I think the Lord and I are going to have some interesting conversations when we consider the manifold temptations that I went through in the light of the glory of God in the eternal state. I'm not sure that I'm going to handle those conversations very well. I don't know that I handle them very well right now. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> we're receiving the end of our faith, even the salvation of our souls. The word receiving is in the present tense. And so I believe that the blessing that will come will not only be in the hereafter, um, it's probably in many respects just around the corner. We're re beginning to receive what we will receive as the Lord leads us uh, through to the other side. You'll remember that Job didn't stay in the state of distress. The Lord gave him double. He gave him double in every sense. He even gave him double the number of years that a man lives so that he can rejoice in the blessing. Uh, Job didn't die at 70. He died at 140. And the theme is that as we go through the stresses and distresses of life, the Lord says, uh, I got some good days for you here on earth, you know, before we get to the end of all this. And uh, that encourages us. But I think there's maybe the third implication of time here, and that is right now. And we can begin to receive the encouragements of the Lord, the end of our faith. We can begin to receive it right now. How's it going? <laughs> and we say, well, there's lots of problems, but uh, I'm receiving part of the end of that faith right now, because uh, the Lord's good enough to me, and I've got this and I've got that. I knocked on Matt Pollock. Many of you remember Matt Pollock. I knocked on his door one morning, and uh, he was on the floor. Uh, I could see him on the floor doing some exercises. And so anyway, when he came to the door, I said, Matt, what were you doing? Oh, well, he says, I was just lying on the floor doing some exercises. I'm praising the Lord for all the things that aren't wrong with me. You can always think of something that's not wrong with you. You can praise the Lord for that. You can praise the Lord for the fact that yesterday's problem appears to be being resolved. Not all of them, but at least one of them. And what happened on Sunday? And uh, uh, you say, well, Sunday was a good day. And, uh, and then you think of some of the problems that went wrong. And then you think of some of the things that went right. And uh, you say, hallelujah. 
you can always praise the Lord for the good things that he is doing. Verse 10 says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace of God that should come unto you. Searching what? Or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom, unto these prophets, it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Marvelous verses. What are they referring to? Well, they're obviously referring to the great salvation into which we've been brought. And uh, <coughs> the Old Testament prophets, uh, at least from Isaiah down through Malachi and all the others unnamed and unheralded, um, what do we know about them? Well, they were trying to figure out what God's plan was. And they were looking ahead. And they were looking ahead to what was going to happen to us. And the marvelous message of the gospel that was preached to us from the day of Pentecost right down to today. Hallelujah. The message hasn't stopped. It's still going out. What a glorious message it is. And uh, Peter says, don't get discouraged, brother. Don't get sidetracked by the problems. Remember, will you, the greatness and the wonder of the gospel message that has been entrusted to us and by the grace of God just preached to us. How do you handle the problems of the day? Answer, you rejoice in all the Lord has given you, and the prophets were full of it. But I wonder if there isn't something more here. Um, I just checked this morning. I'm not sure, but I think the prophets uh, from, Malachi, from Isaiah to Malachi, I think they probably represent about, uh, just about, not quite, but just about 25% of Scripture. So ask yourself the question. The Bible is a big book. The one I'm using right now is about 1,500 pages. The Bible is a big book. What part do I know the most? You say, well, I guess I know most about the Gospels and the Epistles. And uh, what part do I enjoy the most? And you say, well, that's true. But uh, frankly, I enjoy a lot of the uh, uh, I enjoy a lot of the historical books. I enjoy the Psalms. I enjoy the Proverbs. What part do you uh, understand the least? What part do you read the least? What part are you ignorant of the most in the fact that you understand it the least? And uh, so we often tease ourselves and say, well, what am I going to say to Amos and Obadiah when I meet them in heaven? And they'll say, how'd you enjoy my book? And we say, well, 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 well. Uh, Jeremiah says, uh, uh, what do you think about all those long chapters? And you say, well, 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 well. Why don't we read the prophets more? And frankly, uh, they just don't really make the best reading. They're kind of heavy. A friend of mine uh, used to read the Bible many times a year. And he said, to be perfectly frank, he says, I find the prophets just a little bit hard to handle. They, uh, they're, they're pretty heavy stuff, you know. And I don't understand it all. But the parts I do understand, I don't really like that much. Why does Peter refer to that? And I think in part Peter's referring to it because uh, we tend to believe, though we shouldn't, 
that our life is going to be substantially different than the life portrayed by the prophets. Our Lord says all who live in Christ Jesus uh, will suffer persecution. But frankly, most of us don't really know very much about that. I think, frankly, that the saints in Jeremiah's day understood it more than the saints in Solomon's day. And I guess, as I've already told you, if I wanted to live in one day or the other, I'd choose to live in Solomon's day. And the question is, all right, so in the terms of the history of the church, both past, present, and future, where do I live? And I, and I guess the answer is in the very best. It would have been exciting to live 100 years ago when the assemblies were stronger and when, by and large, the whole English-speaking world had a greater knowledge of and love for the Savior than we have. But frankly, we don't live in such terrible days. Peter says, I want you to consider the prophets. They were looking forward to a day, not always like the good days of Solomon. They were looking forward to a lot of sad days where uh, the church will be in distresses that the prophets had to say would befall their people in the short run as well as in the long run. Uh, we get, interestingly, in our day <coughs> uh, to the book of Revelation. And uh, uh, the book of Revelation is a marvelous book of prophecy. Uh, have you noticed that a lot of people in our day get it all confused, mixed up, and backwards? <coughs> And a lot of people will tell you today that uh, they're good people, they love the Lord and all that, but uh, they believe much of the, the teaching of the book of Revelation has already taken place. I say, what? How could you possibly believe that? And they say, well, and they, uh, they say it's already taken place. Uh, the problem is that they don't all agree as to when and where it took place. And they say it's figurative language, and they can't all agree on what how, how the figurative language is figurative. I marvel people go to Luke 16, and they talk about the, uh, the figurative language there. And uh, so I say to them, well, if Luke 16 is figurative, could you please tell me what torment is uh, uh, figured of? What's, uh, what's thirst so much that you'd long for a drop of water? What's that figured of? Well, what's the, what's the picture in fire? Uh, we got to be very careful that we don't take scripture and take the sting out of it by saying the Lord didn't really mean what he said. And if we were to study prophecy a whole lot more, we probably would be prepared by the Spirit of God to anticipate the manifold temptations in a far more real way. What would you have done if you lived in Jerusalem in the 60s? Titus is encroaching. And Saul has destroyed the lives of many and many of the people of God have suffered, some persecuted, some killed, some families torn apart, some families where the husband believes and the wife doesn't and vice versa, and the children don't and the parents don't. And the agony that goes through the families, <clears throat> and then uh, the economic distress as you come home and say to your wife, uh, uh, you better sit down now. I've just been fired. Why were you fired? Oh, the boss gave me 15 different reasons. But I'm sure the only reason I've been fired is because uh, 
I love the Lord Jesus, and he doesn't. And it wasn't easy for the saints in the days of Jerusalem. And it isn't going to be easy for the saints in our day. You've read enough of the news. You've seen what's happened in the last few years. You've seen that the opposition to the church of God seems to be growing in our society rather than going the other way. Uh, pretty heavy stuff. And so you get to verse 13. And verse 13 says this. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the question is, what does that mean? Uh, you can go through uh, conversations in the English language around you for a long time before you hear your neighbor say to you, well, gird up the loins of your mind. What a strange expression. <clears throat> and you'll find that many of the modern translations, uh, and instead of simply saying, gird up the loins of your mind, try to explain what that would mean, and they give you what they think it means. But it's very interesting that Peter didn't say what we think it means. He simply said, gird up the loins of your mind. And so the logical inference there is to go back to Exodus chapter 12. And you'll remember that the children of Israel <clears throat> were told that the Lord was going to pass through the land and that they were going to uh, go on a journey. And the Lord was going to take them back to the land of Israel. Jacob had come down with the others of the 70 way back in the days of Joseph. They've been there for over 400 years, and they were going to go back. And so the Lord says to him, uh, through Moses, you're going to have to gird up your loins. You're going to eat the Passover in haste. you got a long walk ahead of you. And you're going to have to be prepared for the long walk, not as a, a casual uh, stroller might be, with your skirts down, you're going to have to be prepared for the long walk with your loins girt as if you were going to labor in the field all day. Peter says it's true. The manifold temptations are coming. The manifold temptations are here. How are you going to survive? Answer, you're going to survive with exactly the same attitude that the children of Israel had when they came out of Egypt, and you're not going to survive if you don't have that attitude. Um, do you remember how easy it was for the children of Israel to get from Egypt to Canaan? And the answer wasn't terribly easy. Do you remember that uh, on occasion they complained, as a matter of fact, because it was so hard? They complained because it was so long. They complained because they didn't have enough water to drink. They did. They just didn't think they did. They complained because they didn't have enough food to eat. They did. They just got tired of it. But frankly, it was a long walk. And there were some hot days. They had the pillar of cloud to protect them. But it wasn't easy. And they had to stand on the sea, on the Red Sea, and look across and say, we're not going to make it. And then they do. And they shout for joy on the other side. But just the same, when they were on the near side, it wasn't that easy. 
Now, Peter said, welcome to Cappadocia. You say, I don't want to live in Cappadocia. I'd rather be somewhere else. The Lord says, welcome to Cappadocia. You say, well, how am I going to get through Cappadocia? And the answer is we've learned a lot of good principles already, but here's the key, verse 13. Gird up the loins of your mind. You're going on a long journey, and Egypt is going to be behind you. And the leeks and the garlics and the onions, they're going to be left behind too. And so Peter's going to say, I've got a few more chapters to write here. Uh, I think I'm going to tell you some of the things that you might put into your mind in order to get through the issues that are going to be part of enduring the manifold temptations. So our time is gone for this morning. We'll carry on uh, uh, in our later sessions to see how Peter unfolds this uh, dilemma that we find ourselves in and uh, uh, how he can give us <laughs> the tools to get through and, and rejoice in the midst of the manifold temptations that are there. Lord, we want to thank you for being a God who cares enough to address the issues. And the fact is, we've got issues, Lord. We've all got manifold temptations that, that cause us to grieve and often to complain when we shouldn't. And often to be distressed. And the fact is, Lord, they are trials of faith. And we pray that by the grace of God, we'll heed the counsel of God and that we will get to the other side. Not all got from Egypt to Canaan, Lord, but Caleb did, Joshua did. By the grace of God, Lord, we want to get to the other side and to rejoice with exceeding joy and full of glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.